Welcome to Bible study this evening. Uh, I was plowing today with Stanfast, Great Heart, and uh, another horse from my friend Melvin Hurst's place. And it's so peaceful to be able to flip that cover crop upside down, see all the earthworms. And this is a good way to end the day. So before we begin, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can come to you with all our concerns, all our burdens, all our problems. Thank you that you're bigger than all our problems. You're bigger than anything that we can or we cannot see. Father, we ask that you would speak to us now through your word and through the Holy Spirit. We're asking that you would bind Satan and his evil angels, that you will shield the recording here so that it can go through. Shield this recording from the enemy. Shield our minds from the enemy so that we can learn and grasp the truth that you want us to know. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. Okay, we are singing from the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. And then we're also singing from chapter 5 and verse 2. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Who remembers our memory verse? You remember? I the, the, it's got something to do with by entertaining strangers. Yes. You you're may on. have entertained angels in disguise. Yes, you're on the right track, Brother Bill. But I don't know it word for word or the reference. <laughs> you have the main concept. That That's what's important. I'll give you a hint. The name of the book starts with an H. Hebrews? Hebrews, that's right. And I was born on the 13th day of the month. So it's Hebrews chapter 13. And Stephanie, do you remember the verse? Two. Two. Yes, Stephanie remembers. <clears throat> Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Be not forgetful. Hebrews 13, verse 2. We are on day six. We're in year one, quarter one, lesson 11. And we're on page 256 in our green curriculum. A well-ordered household. Of Abraham, it is written that he was called the friend of God, the father of all that believe. James chapter 2 and verse 23 and Romans chapter 4 and verse 11. The testimony of God concerning this faithful patriarch is, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And again, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham 
that which he hath spoken of him. It was a high honor to which Abraham was called, that of being the father of the people who for centuries were the guardians and preservers of the truth of God for the world, of that people through whom all the nations of the earth should be blessed in the advent of the promised Messiah. But he who called the patriarch judged him worthy. It is God that speaks. He who understands the thoughts afar off and places the right estimate upon men says, I know him. There would be on the part of Abraham no betraying of the truth for selfish purposes. He would keep the law and deal justly and righteously. And he would not only fear the Lord himself, but would cultivate religion in his home. He would instruct his family in righteousness. What is righteousness? Can someone give me a definition? Uh, I would say teaching people to walk in the ways that are good. Definitely. Good answer. Yes, righteousness is right doing. It is the path for God's children to walk in. The law of God would be the rule in his household. Abraham's household comprised more than a thousand souls. Those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God found a home in his encampment, and here, as in a school, they received such instruction as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. Thus a great responsibility rested upon him. He was training heads of families, and his methods of government would be carried out in the households over which they should preside. In early times, the father was the ruler and priest of his own family, and he exercised authority over his children, even after they had families of their own. His descendants were taught to look up to him as their head, both in religious and secular matters. This patriarchal system of government Abraham endeavored to perpetuate, as it tended to preserve the knowledge of God. It was necessary to bind the members of the household together in order to build up a barrier against the idolatry that had become so widespread and so deep-seated. Abraham sought by every means in his power to guard the inmates of his encampment against the mingling with the heathen and witnessing their idolatrous practices, for he knew that familiarity with evil would insensibly corrupt the principles. The greatest care was exercised to shut out every form of false religion and to impress the mind with the majesty and glory of the living God as the true object of worship. It was a wise arrangement which God himself had made to cut off his people so far as possible from connection with the heathen, making them a people dwelling alone and not reckoned among the nations. He had separated Abraham from his idolatrous kindred that the patriarch might train and educate his family apart from the seductive influences which would have surrounded them in Mesopotamia, and that the true faith might be preserved in its purity by his descendants from generation to generation. Abraham's affection for his children and his household led him to guard their religious faith, to impart to them a knowledge of the divine statutes as the most precious legacy he could transmit to them and through the world. Money is not the most precious legacy that you can give your children. Property, real estate, is not the most precious legacy that you can leave to your children. The most precious legacy that you can leave to your children 
is that you instill in them a love for our Creator God, Jehovah, a love for our Father in Heaven, for His Son, Jesus, a love for His Word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That is the most precious legacy that you can give your children. You may not have much money. You may not have much property. But if you're a parent, you have the opportunity to leave a legacy of your children. You can pass on the faith, the trust that you have in your Heavenly Father. You can pass that on to your children. Now, it is true that some children will not receive that gift. But you can still offer it to them. It is theirs for the taking. All were taught that they were under the rule of the God of heaven. There was to be no oppression on the part of the parents and no disobedience on the part of the children. God's law had appointed to each his duties and only in obedience to it could any secure happiness or prosperity. His own example, the silent influence of his daily life, was a constant lesson. The unswerving integrity the benevolence and unselfish courtesy which had won the admiration of kings were displayed in the home. There was a fragrance about the life, a nobility and loveliness of character which revealed to all that he was connected with heaven. There was a fragrance about the life, a nobility and loveliness of character which revealed to all that he was connected with heaven. Is there a fragrance about your life? Is there a loveliness, a nobility in your character? People could see that Abraham was connected with heaven. May we live our lives in such a way that people can see that we are connected with the King of Kings, with the Lord of Lords. So we are connected with heaven. He did not neglect the soul of the humblest servant. In his household, there was not one law for the master and another for the servant. A royal way for the rich and another way for the poor. All were treated with justice and compassion as inheritors with him in the grace of life. So he didn't treat some as, oh, you're just a poor person. Oh, you're, yes, Mr. Jones, let me escort you. <gasps> no, he treated all with kindness, compassion, justice. He will command his household. There would be no sinful neglect to restrain the evil propensities of his children. No weak, unwise, indulgent favoritism. No yielding of his conviction of duty to the claims of mistaken affection. Abraham would not only give right instruction, but he would maintain the authority of just and righteous laws. How few there are in our day who follow this example. On the part of too many parents, there is a blind and selfish sentimentalism, miscalled love, which is manifested in leaving children with their unformed judgment and undisciplined passions to the control of their own will. This is the various cruelty to the youth and a great wrong to the world. Parental indulgence causes disorder in families and in society. It confirms in the young the desire to follow inclination instead of submitting to the divine requirements. Thus they grow up with a heart adverse to doing God's will, and they transmit their irreligious, insubordinate spirit to their children and their children's children. Like Abraham, parents should command their households after them. 
Let obedience to parental authority be taught and enforced as the first step in obedience to the authority of God. The light esteem in which the law of God is held, even by religious leaders, has been productive of great evil. The teaching which has become so widespread that the divine statutes are no longer binding upon men is the same as idolatry in its effects upon the morals of the people. Those who seek to lessen the claims of God's holy law are striking directly at the foundation of the government of families and nations. Religious parents, failing to walk in his statutes, do not command their household to keep the way of the Lord. The law of God is not made the rule of life. The children, as they make homes of their own, feel under no obligation to teach their children what they themselves have never been taught. And this is why there are so many godless families. This is why depravity is so deep and widespread. Not until parents themselves walk in the law of the Lord with perfect hearts will they be prepared to command their children after them. A reformation in this respect is needed. A reformation which shall be deep and broad. Parents need to reform. Ministers need to reform. They need God in their households. Have you ever heard someone say, do as I say, but don't do as I do? Unfortunately, that's how many parents operate today. Thankfully, that's not how Abraham operated. He led by example. Parents, lead by example. If you're an older brother or an older sister, lead by example. Put God first in your life. Obey Him. And that will help your younger siblings to follow you. Maybe you're a young person and you don't have any siblings. You don't have a younger brother or younger sister. You have friends. And you may not realize it, but they may be looking up to you. They may be following your example. And if you'll walk in God's righteous ways... Others will follow in your footsteps. If you walk in the ways of this world and you walk a life of sin, people will also walk in your footsteps. What example do you want to lead? If they would see a different state of things, they must bring His Word into their families and must make it their counselor. They must teach their children that it is the voice of God addressed to them and is to be implicitly obeyed. They should patiently instruct their children, kindly and untiringly teach them how to live in order to please God. The children of such a household are prepared to meet the sophistries of infidelity. They have accepted the Bible as the basis of their faith. And they have a foundation that cannot be swept away by the incoming tide of skepticism. In too many households, prayer is neglected. Parents feel that they have no time for morning and evening worship. They cannot spare a few moments to be spent in thanksgiving to God for His abundant mercies, for the blessed sunshine and the flowers of rain which cause vegetation to flourish, and for the guardianship of holy angels. They have no time to offer prayer for divine help and guidance, and for the abiding presence of Jesus in the household. They go forth to labor as the ox or the horse goes, without one thought of God or heaven. They have souls so precious that rather than permit them to be hopelessly lost, The Son of God gave His life to ransom them. But they have little more appreciation of His great goodness 
than have the beasts that perish. Like the patriarch of old, those who profess to love God should erect an altar to the Lord wherever they pitch their tent. If ever there was a time when every household should be a house of prayer, it is now. Fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication for themselves and their children. Let the father, as priest of the household, lay upon the altar of God the morning and evening sacrifice, while the wife and children unite in prayer and praise. In such a household, Jesus will love to tarry. From every Christian home, a holy light should shine forth. Love should be revealed in action. It should flow out in all home conversations, showing itself in thoughtful kindness, in gentle, unselfish courtesy. There are homes where this principle is carried out. Homes where God is worshipped and truest love reigns. From these homes, morning and evening, prayer ascends to God as sweet incense, and His mercies and blessings descend upon suppliants like the morning dew. A well-ordered Christian household is a more powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. All can see that there is an influence at work in the family that affects the children, and that the God of Abraham is with them. If the homes of professed Christians had a right religious mold, they would exert a mighty influence for good, they would indeed be the light of the world. The God of Abraham speaks to every faithful parent in the words addressed to Abraham. I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Courteous family members are a powerful argument for the truth. Okay, we have some review questions. In James chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Abraham was called the friend of God. And in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, Abraham was referenced as the father of all them that believe. What was Abraham called? A friend of God. And? The father of all them who believe. That's right. Yes. Brother Bill has a very sharp mind. He remembers where the tools are. (laughs) I can lay them down and forget them, but God gave Brother Bill a photographic memory to remember where the tools are. And he remembers so much from the lessons, too. How many members were in Abraham's household? I didn't know that. I don't remember. Do you remember, Mm Seth? Okay. 1,000. I remembered was Lot, Sarah, Ishmael, Isaac, <laughs> and that's about as far as I got. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he had so many people, servants working for him. Wow. Who can describe for me what a well-ordered Christian home is like? It would be a uh, God-centered home. Definitely. Yes, yes. God yeah. would be the you center. Put him in the center of it, and base all your choices and decisions around what he would want. Definitely, yes. 
Yes. A Christian home, a well-ordered home, will have God's love flowing out of it. A Christian home will have God's light shining out of it. The conversations will be kind, thoughtful, gentle, and unselfish. In fact, uh, the rules regarding elders in the book of Acts, I believe, will also demonstrate what a well-ran household should be. Definitely. Yes. Okay, we are going to learn about sycamore trees. A sycamore tree is a shade tree with reddish-brown wood. It grows in fertile lowlands and beside streams, and therefore it is written in 1 Chronicles chapter 27, verse 28, that the sycamore trees were in the low plains. And that's true today. Sycamores like to grow along the creeks and in wet, more moist, swampy areas. That's where you'll see sycamores growing. We have lots of sycamores growing around here. Um, some of you may have seen the swing that we put up by the stream here. And that swing that we put up is in a sycamore tree. A sycamore tree can be recognized by its leaves, which are broad and have large teeth. The stem of each leaf is hollow at the base where the next year's buds grow. The flowers on the sycamore have either stamens or pistils. The fruits are similar to the fig, except they grow directly from the trunk of the tree on little sprigs instead of the branches like nearly all other fruit. Each piece is made up of many tiny dry fruits, which are tightly packed together. The fruit is called Achenes, A-C-H-E-N-E-S. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The fruit can remind us of many parts making up one fruit, like Abraham's family and its members. Sounds like the sycamore that this is referring to is not the kind that goes around in this area. Two different kinds. The sycamore that grows here grows a seed ball about this big around and then you can break it apart and it's like little parachutes and they'll fly all over. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Amos chapter 7 and verse 14. Amos was a gardener as well as a herdsman, and he knew the importance of pricking each fruit with a sharp knife or skewer at the right stage of development in order to help it to ripen properly. The word gatherer in Amos chapter 7 and verse 14 means one who cuts or scrapes or cuts into the little fruit. Unless the fruit is pierced, it will secrete a quantity of watery juice and will not ripen. The sycamore fruit symbolizes in a striking way the nature and end of the fruit of sin. It is produced and perfected in an abnormal, unnatural way by man's methods. Other fruit is the free product of its tree, and it ripens naturally without man's help. But the sycamore fruit ripens from a wound, made by man. And so it is with the fruit of sin, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6. Sin is a result of a breach or a wound in God's holy law. 
The people of Sodom and Gomorrah were about to reap the fruit of their sins. The American sycamore is different than the Bible sycamore. It grows to a height of 175 feet, or 53 meters, and can be 14 feet, or 4 meters, through the trunk. The bark on the lower trunk is reddish-brown, and the branches are live green. The bark on the branches breaks off in tiny scales. When the scales fall away, they show the inner bark that is light cream in color. When you are cutting a piece of fruit, think about what kind of fruit is ripening in your life. Are the fruits of righteousness ripening in your life? Or are the fruits of sin ripening in your life? God desires that heaven's plan shall be carried out, and heaven's divine order and harmony prevail in every family, in every church, in every institution. Did this love leaven society? We should see the outworking of noble principles in Christian refinement and courtesy and in Christian charity towards the purchase of the blood of Christ. Spiritual transformation would be seen in all our churches, our families, our institutions. When this transformation takes place, these agencies will become instrumentalities by which God will impart heaven's light to the world, and thus, through divine discipline and training, fit men and women for the society of heaven. We can walk on this journey with Jesus. This life can be a school. And in this school, we can be prepared to go up there to heaven. All right, let's close with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we could learn about a well-ordered Christian home. Many of us have not grown up in a well-ordered Christian home. We don't even know what that looks like or what it feels like. Many parents are trying to raise their children they don't have a, a good role model from their parents to follow. So I'm asking for those that are struggling because they didn't grow up in it and they don't know how to replicate it. I'm asking that you would show them and teach them how to have a family, how to have a home that's ordered according to your principles. Thank you for giving this extra help to those that need it right now. We ask that you would bless each one of us here and those that are watching. And we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen.